Welcome back to another video on scripting in Reactor. We were already in the previous video looking at how we could use a quick bar and a configuration that is available called demo scripting to explore scripting inside of Reactor. This is teaching you better features of Reactor. These are officially not released, they are subject to change, uh, but they are likely to be here in some sort of form because they are already very functional despite the very limited function set that exists in the scripts. And this is what a script looks like. It is JavaScript an engine built in so that you can apply a JavaScript to be executed whenever you press a button or you rotate on a code or move a fader, you can have uh, a little script uh, being executed. And then uh, it also can be running on layers like a, um, a background process. And we'll cover these things in these videos. But we got so far that in the first video, we already looked at how we can um, have these scripts running. So we did that for two buttons on the configuration for the quick bar here. So if we um, click a button like this one, we click show more, then you see something called event script. And an event script is executed every time the behavior receives the trigger of any type. So let's just press this one. You can see this is what the first script we looked at looks like. And then if we take the second button, we had a little bit of a more complex one that looked like this in the editor. And that would rotate the labels of the display. So if we go to simulation mode, I press this down, you can see that it's rotating the label of the button here. Nice. In this video, we'll implement a feature the ATEM switcher doesn't have in itself. And that is enabling the key, turning the key on by a transition. Normally, if you just click the on air button, you know, the key is turned on or it's off, but we want it to transition with a nice transition. Well, the thing is, this requires multiple steps and scripting is great for doing exactly that because we can wait for the execution of uh, other steps before we take the next one and so on. And what we basically need to do in a script right now is this. Enable this key um, next transition button, then we disable this one. So when we press the auto button, we transition the key on, then we enable the background again and we turn this one off. Because if I, if I press auto right now, I get an auto transition between the two sources. But if I do it when only the key is on like that, I only transition the key on and off. And that's what we want, okay? So that's what our script will be doing. And this is also how we can basically monitor what is going to happen as we execute this. So let's move over to the configuration again. And this is what the third button does, the scripted button number three. In our configuration, this is the behavior called scripted button three. It's right there. And let's look at the content of this one. Well, first of all, we see there's a, um, a constant apparently in place here. But if we look at the... Um, the configuration, we also see we have more or less the same as before. We have a pink background color for the button. We have conditional feedback that will show us when the script is running. That's all good and fine. We have the script in itself, which looks pretty long and so on. But let's just check the JSON code out because that gives us everything in a concise view so we can see everything that has been defined. Um, actually, one thing we have not seen in the previous ones is this constant. So the constant is something that is made to make this behavior um, kind of flexible so that we could copy the behavior or we could create a master behavior and then just change the constant to indicate which upstream key we are using. We need to change this number from two to one because we have only upstream key number one on our item mini over here. Apart from that, we have the event script right here. It has a max runtime of 10 seconds. And then we have the standard default feedback with the label and so on. I don't think there's a lot to say about that. Let's read the description. On button down trigger, the script will simulate an auto transition for the selected upstream key defined by the constants from the selected ME row defined by a variable. Ah, defined by a variable. Nice, interesting. But let's check a look, uh, take a look at the script itself. So um, we'll just open it in the editor. Let's close down the old editor here and then open it over here. Format the code and then let's, let's go through this. First of all, we can define functions in our scripting. So there's a function called usk label that depending on a value a, if that is zero, it gives us background. Otherwise, usk plus the name of the um, variable. I wonder where that is being used, but I can, if I highlight it, press command E, then I can um, uh, see that it's also used down here in line, line, uh, line number 19. So this is being used for the console logging output. So we can keep an eye out from that for that, I guess. That would be nice and useful. Okay. 
Um, but let's let's move on and see what's going on here. Like we have seen before in the previous video, there is an event um, that activates the script. And we are looking to see if that event is a binary event and if the button was pressed down. And only in that case will we actually work with this behavior. Then the next thing we do is that we get the um, IO reference value of the constant. So here, behavior colon const colon usk. You might have seen that in other videos where we are using IO references to refer to constants in the behavior and we can do the same in the script. We get that value out as an integer, then we print it to the console so we can check it. Then we also get the, the value of the ME row variable and then we print that out to the console. So we'll be looking out for those two things. Then the next thing that happens is that we are picking up the current transition state because we want to make sure that if we had like four upstream keys here, any configuration on the next transition for those upstream keys has to be recorded and reinstalled whenever we are done doing our auto transition. And this is why we are now looping over those five and we are storing them in a variable inside the script then the next thing we we do is <clears throat> we set the new transition states starting with the upstream keys since and, and that is because we need to um, enable the upstream key um, inside of this one. I think we're going. Do, are we going through this twice? Anyway, I am. Um, <clears throat> I need to set the up, enable the upstream key that I want to change, and then I disable the other ones. And that's what's basically going on here, where we are setting the IO reference values of the next transition parameter for the ATEM switcher. By the way, ATEM switcher number one, so this is the hard-coded aspect. And if you wanted to make this flexible, you could use the variable device index, which is what we typically use. But we'll just continue today with the um, uh, what has um, what is in this um, demo script. Then you can see how we construct the IO reference by first we need the ME row here, and then finally we need the upstream key uh, indicator or upstream key number which is the number A plus one in this case. Um, yes, because it starts at zero and goes up to five. And I guess number five is probably the background. Something that can be checked. Oh, wait, probably zero is the background. But um, nah, now I'm confused. Anyway, if I wanted to know this, because you might ask, ask yourself, how do you know, Casper, that this is the next transition, next transition on your ATEM switcher that you're changing? Well, this is something that if you go into the home tab and you go up to the little pencil for the device core, you click parameter list. This is where you get all that good stuff from. So let's just search up transition, next transition and see what's uh, happening here. We see that's the parameter I'm talking about and it has two dimensions. So that means two parameters after the slashes. The first one is the ME row. The next one is the uh, background and the keys that we want to refer to. Now, what you need to watch out for is which ATEM model is it. So you see all these and that's the ATEM Mini right here. So probably it's pretty much, yes, you, you can just see the limitations basically is that we have only one upstream key. So it is going to be number one and number two. I, my script is trying to do this for all four. And this is why you find in the script itself, if you go back here, you can see that it is actually checking if the value is dash 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 because the value dash 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 is uh, one that is no wait this is how this is what we store um but maybe it's because it's getting stored next transition state ah yeah it's because it's coming back here when i'm referring by this one with the me row and also the kia by going through all five to record the states, I would get the value dash 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 in the case that the parameter actually doesn't exist. And this is my way of then detecting, did I record a state from a key that doesn't exist? In that case, I'm not gonna do anything to it. Um, okay, <clears throat> but I'm setting that IO reference, then I'm, um, what am I doing? I'm basically going through a loop here where I'm waiting to check if it gets set. In other words, I'm reading the value back to make sure that it happened. And if it happens, then I am breaking out of this loop and moving on to the next one. So I'm checking all the time. I'm not just blindly sending these off. I'm actually making sure that my manipulation of the key is happening according to my intention. Then after having done that, I'm executing the auto. Once again, if you want to see that the, um, it, you, yeah, it's actually right there. That's the, that's the parameter, the auto. Um, trigger, if, if I want to set that, you have it right there. I'm executing that. I'm just sleeping for 100 milliseconds. 
um, waiting for the transition to complete by basically checking here if the transition in transition, which is a parameter, let's just search that one up, is um, that is indicating it's it's a binary feedback and you can't control it. So this is a flag in the ASIM switcher that will tell you whether you are in the middle of a transition or not. And if you are, then um, uh, we, are, we are basically waiting for that to complete. And when that's complete, we are out here on the other side and now we are returning the transition state back to the normal. I think we really want to see this running. So let's just go over to the simulator here, enable that, move into position. I think we want to have our ATEM software control in place so we can follow along here. So what we should see as I click this button is that we uh, have a change over to key one, it should make a transition and then move back to this configuration. Let's check. Ah, I know what we did wrong. We did not set the right upstream gear. In the meantime, let's just check the locks because in the locks we should see things like this. You can see that it is saying to us, it's telling us that we um, are using upstream key number two, which doesn't exist. We have the ME row from variable, um, ME row number one from a variable, and that variable is this one down here. It is one right now. Okay, and then it is storing the state for the background and the USK and so on. And it's changing from true to false. Got error for parameter because it doesn't exist, blah, blah, blah. So a number of things is not really working out the way we want. But if we change that value to one, it should all be good. So now let's check this out once again. Let's just go back here to the ASIM control so we can see that and click the button. All right, just watch it happening. All these actions happening in just one button click by our little script. All right. So, um, yeah. See, what I just managed to do right there is to stop the script from executing. But notice that, uh, <laughs> okay, let's just try it again. Um, when I press this button and I click the stop, uh, the auto button here, I stop it in the middle of the transition. So the script will be basically caught in its own loop right here. It is constantly just waiting for the transition to complete and it never gets out of this loop. In other words, it's never going to restore the next transitions up here. But at the end of it all, it will stop the script execution because it was set to timeout after 10 seconds. Okay, let's just try it again. So we have it working. Oh, wait, of course, because it did not set the background back like this. So somehow the waiting for the transition to complete, you can argue that it should sort of be aware of its own timeout time and then not wait after like eight seconds and then decide, okay, let's just do a cut and then reinstall the next transition because that memory is now lost. But anyway, now I'm back to the to the normal and if I stopped it right there and then if I complete it like this, it will still complete and it will stop the scripting. But if I start it and stop it like this, ah, okay, wait. Oh, now it's getting funny. Okay, let's just try once again here. So generally it's working, but then, okay, I got to stop. Notice that it's going to time out about now. Yes. And um, because 10 seconds elapsed. All right, guys, um, that was the next video on scripting. We have more for you. So check back on this channel for the third episode on scripting in Reactor.